Well, at last, and I don't just mean at last PNSO is back, but at last my long-awaited, hoped-for and predicted updated Triceratops is here. PNSO sure knows how to break a fast with a bang. And they've chosen to do that with the quintessential Ceratopsian Triceratops. A very nice New Year, Christmas present to be sure. And just as their groundbreaking 2020 T-Rex did, I'm sure that this Triceratops will prove to be equally controversial. I think that's actually a good thing, because it spurs debates and excited discussion, and hopefully the result is that all of us come away better educated. So what I'll do is first talk about the model itself, and then I'll leave my thoughts on the cheeks, the horns, and other miscellaneous sciencey bits to the end, and you can stay on if you're interested in that. So this is the new Doyle, the Triceratops. Discounting for the horns, this model measures about 23 centimeters or 9 inches from snout to tail tip. Triceratops was one of the larger ceratopsians, and at an estimated 8 to 9 meters, or 26 to 29.5 feet, this model is 1 to 35 to 1 to 40 scale. Now PNSO states 8 meters for this model. So scaling very well with the Wilson T-Rex. For Ceratopsians, the focal point is the head, and for one as iconic as Triceratops, great attention is paid to it the way it was with T-Rex. Now straight away, this makes a statement. I'll just look at the level of detail in the scales the regional variability in size and shape. Our PNSO has decided to forego the keratinized face you sometimes see depicted for Triceratops, but perhaps in a nod to that idea, you can see an area that's differentiated by having these larger scales, quite separate from this forward area. Initial reports by Dr. Alan McDonnell from the Canadian Museum of Nature of skin impressions on a Triceratops frill seemed to support scales on the frill and not keratin. Now that was back in 2018, and if someone knows of a follow-up study, please let me know in the comments below. Just look at how exquisite the detail is here. The frill isn't the typical Triceratops shape you might be used to, and from certain angles gives me Taurosaurus vibes. It also lacks the epoxipithals that are often a distinct feature seen in Triceratops frills. Now this does agree with the Horner and Goodwin 2006 proposal that as Triceratops matured, its epoxipithals went from distinct and delta-shaped to eventually flattening and merging into the frill margin. So there's some basis for this interpretation in Doyle here. The frill is surprisingly plain and so possibly doesn't serve as a sexual billboard. Triceratops does have a solid frill, and it's one Ceratopsian that might really have used its frill as a defensive shield. If so, perhaps the frill is all business and no show, unlike in other Ceratopsians. As you may have expected, compared to the release images, because they chose to go with a plain frill, the only way to elevate that was to add more depth and complexity in the painting, which is what you see in the image. Here, they've made a change, with a splash of yellow on each side as you see here. So while losing some of that depth in the prototype, you have a simpler application, but with at least some kind of embellishment. Now also in the face, there's a much sharper distinction between dark and light, which you may or may not like. In fact, in general, I'd say that the in-hand model is lighter than what you see in the release image. The horns are really long, perhaps longer than we're used to. While plausible given enough layering of keratin, it certainly precludes grazing. I really like the texturing they've added to the horn. It reminds me a little of the sable antelope with these concentric grooves. The color fade is very nice. 
the beak is sharply defined, with both the predentary and premaxilla covered in sharp keratin. The jaw articulates. Now you might not like this because of the seam here under the chin, but personally, I'm okay with an articulated jaw if it serves some kind of illustrative purpose, biomechanical or anatomical, in this case, both. How the predentary fits under the premaxilla and man, the fit on mine is really tight. And this little strip here, which I'll talk about in the science part of this video. And that also relates to, as you can see, it lacks the cheek, typically seen in reconstructions. And within, you can see the teeth. And it's nice that they've included this tiny detail, though as you'd expect, some misses in the paint given this size. Now I'll talk more about the horns and the cheeks near the end of the video. In general, I'm very happy with the head, although I will say that even if the frill was used as a protective shield, it possibly served double duty as an attraction device, so more patterning really would have been very welcome here. Now the body is not too different from the typical ceratopsian bow plan, except from certain angles, the hip does appear to be a lot flatter than commonly depicted. Now I think it's because this very wide ilium here, which rides quite a bit higher on this model compared to other reconstructions I've seen, therefore losing that kind of a curve and creating a different silhouette. The famous Lane specimen has an extensive patch of preserved skin with polygonal scales, many of them with central nipple-like protrusions, which may have been spikes or supports for filaments, and both have been depicted in various models. For example, little spikes in the Sideshow Triceratops and filaments in the first PNSO Doyle. Now Tyler Greenfield explains why both aren't really plausible, and I'll link to his blog article below. You can see the conservative approach taken here, while still respecting the Lane specimen. Now frustratingly, as far as I know, Lane still hasn't been described, even though it's been over 10 years. Now I don't know what's going on, or maybe I missed a paper. Again, if one of you knows, please tell me below. Now, color-wise, it's definitely realistic for a big animal like this. And like the release images, there are still shades and layers, so you do get a depth of color, just like in real animals. But just too plain for me. Now, subtle variations like you see in the PNSO Sinoceratops and Pachyrhinosaurus still add visual interest without being over the top. Now much has already been written about ceratopsian posture. The consensus now seems to be a slight elbows out, with the forelimbs having a wider stance than the hind limbs, as you can see here in Paul and Christiansen's 2009. The number and position of toes are correct. Now we know that digits 4 and 5 of the manus were not weight-bearing. And while they seem a little low to ground here, reconstructions such as in the Fujiwara 2009 paper show digits 4 and 5 extending and even dorsiflexing in contact with the ground. But just because it contacts the ground doesn't mean it supports the weight, and that paper also notes that only digits 1 to 3 were weight-bearing. And also, only digits 1 to 3 were angual, and digits 4 and 5 are correctly unclawed, so that's nice to see. The right front manus is not flat to the ground, so the model itself does bear weight here. But since this is the front forelimb, it looks okay, as if the animal is reaching mid-stride and in transition before the full weight is borne by the other digits. Now most of us, after heel strike, contact the ground with the lateral border of the foot first before rolling off into pronation, so I'm okay with that. 
So my overall feel is a strong, bulky, powerful animal with heavily muscled legs, capable of raw bursts of energy and violence. And just standing there, he looks imposing. And as for the pose, I couldn't be happier. There are many ways to interpret this. Reading himself for confrontation, approaching a potential mate, or just minding his own business. And this can be given various shades depending on how open the mouth is. But best of all, it reminds me of this painting by Charles R. Knight, which I'm sure even the youngsters among you would have seen. For a perfect mix of state-of-the-art reconstruction and a nostalgic retro vibe, this PNSO gives me both. Now, just a quick mention of the extras. The posters, the painting cards, the activity cards, and a QR code that leads to the story behind this model, which I'll let you discover for yourself. The idea is that you can create the kind of exhibit you might see in a dinosaur exhibition, a very interactive and educational activity for children that I'm really happy that PNSO hasn't forgotten and not just focus on adults. Now we do want to show you the 1 to 35 skull. The only other skull I have came as an exclusive with the Sideshow T-Rex vs Triceratops, so it's nice to have one in the 1 to 35 scale. It makes me wish PNSO will release an add-on 1 to 35 T-Rex skull. Now let's get to the juicy, sciencey stuff, and then we'll look at some comparisons after that. Cheeks. For a long time, ornithischian dinosaurs have been proposed to have cheeks to hold food during mastication and to support the elongate rostrum. Without a cheek holding in the food as it chewed, we have that old joke of careful, some of it's entering your mouth. I still remember as a kid years ago, reading Dr. David Norman explain that inset teeth suggested that Iguanodon had cheeks. Now, to be clear, true cheeks like ours are formed by the buccinator muscle, which spans the maxilla and the mandible. No extent reptiles or birds have them, so various ideas have been proposed to explain how dinosaurs might have evolved pseudo-cheeks from the muscles we are sure they did have. The result traditionally looks along the lines of this, a vertical sheath of muscle bridging two anatomical landmarks, the labial ridge of the maxilla, LMR, and the labial ridge of the dentary, LDR, and few questions asked. The problem is that any explanation behind this convenient sheath of muscle has always involved a host of attachment site differentiations, muscle reorientations, and other evolutionary gymnastics which EPB considers highly unparsimonious. Nama Vizade in 2018 published a paper in which he re-examined a wide range of craniomandibular material from the major ornithischian groups, including hadrosaurs, ankylosaurs, and of course, ceratopsians. It's a delightful but technical read, so I'll just highlight two points of interest. There are actually many. Now first he notes the prominence of the LDR and its shelf-like appearance in Ceratopsians, seen here in Centrosaurus. Now second, he notes that in Ceratopsians, the coronoid process is much taller and more columnar than other ornithischians. So the muscle that would usually attach here, the adductor mandibulae externus superficialis, or the AMES, has a small moment arm, very little mechanical advantage, and might also set up dangerous joint reaction forces. And taken together, he proposes that the AMES no longer insert on the coronoid, but onto the LDR as a broad expansion, resulting in this. So how does this relate to Doyle? Well, this is probably the reconstruction we're used to, with this vertically oriented muscle wall giving us this kind of outline, and hence the traditional look. With the new proposal, this muscle is gone, replaced by the proposed AMES expansion. We now have this outline, with the AMES represented by this strip in a PNSO model, resulting in this new outline, and hence the new cheekless doyle. 
I should mention that uh, the buccal osteoderms in nodosaurids, such as Edmontonia, do suggest that some soft tissue in the cheek was present in at least some dinosaurs. Taurosaurus or Triceratops No, this isn't a rehash of that Taurosaurus is Triceratops can of worms. Let's agree they are indeed different dinosaurs. It's really more to do with, is this model Triceratops or Taurosaurus? And this relates to whether the fossil it's based on, AMNH5116, is in fact a Triceratops or a Taurosaurus. To understand this, look at this photograph of AMNH5116. This has in fact been filled in extensively with plaster. Now look at this AMNH5116 skull by Ferdino and Diventard. Notice that the filled in part that would have helped us identify if this was Taurosaurus, such as the fenestrae, or the epoxipitals are frustratingly absent. Horns The shape, orientation, and length of the horns will almost certainly be polarizing. Now, most of you know what we have are the fossilized bone cores of horns, and in real life, these were covered by keratin sheaths. Here we have AMNH5116 with the horn cores. Now, superimposing this image of the new Doyle, I'm not 100% perfect, granted, but I don't see anything too egregiously off with the orientation. Now, the question is how much keratin goes on that and what shape? Dr. Mark Witten discusses this in a blog post I'll reference below. Keratin is essentially dead tissue, like fingernails and hair. They grow from the horn core, where the newest material is laid down, while the oldest layers are pushed out. Now, taking the example of this bovid horn, the tips will be the oldest, most external part. They were pushed out by the next older layer here. And this was pushed out by this layer, and so on and so forth, until we reach the youngest part over the horn core, where the new material is synthesized. So the overall external appearance is still influenced by the shape of the horn core to an extent. By similarly stacking layers on, Dr. Witten arrives at a possible result recurved horns and near useless for defense. Now given that alternative, I'll take this PNSO any day of the week and twice on Sundays. Here at least Doyle has a fighting chance against T-Rex. Not much of a grazing chance, however. And finally, some comparisons. Now first is my most up-to-date Triceratops till now, the Safari 2018. A roughly 1 to 35 scale 2, and a fine example of Doug Watson's work. Of course, we have to bring out the original Doyle. And here you can see that this follows a much more traditional look. In the frill, the epoxipitals, the pseudo cheek, the shape and the size of the horns, still very nice and detailed, and favoring the interpretation of a continuation of quills here. Uh, we should also compare him to some of the newer PNSO ceratopsians. Here we have the Sinoceratops. Uh, despite some improvement, you can see how good these older PNSOs still are. And my favorite, the Pachyrhinosaurus. Finally, of course, the Nemesis 2020 Wilson T Rex. Uh, what a delightful pairing, not just because of the 1 to 35 scale, but also in terms of poetic symmetry. Both kicked off a new year, both were the most up to date sculpt of the epitome of their iconic group, both represented PNSO's evolution up to that point, both are based on AMNH specimens, and both as a pair have been locked in that perennial struggle between predator and prey. And for many of us, they were our first and most memorable vision of conflict in the world of dinosaurs, and so they belong together on any display shelf. 
So that's it for this long video. But one of PNSO's masterpieces like this call for it, not just for the model, but to discuss the science behind as well. I'm happy to see another improved PNSO, this time in a Ceratopsian. And I'm really looking forward to the Styracosaurus and a real representative Taurosaurus from PNSO. I'm dying to hear what you have to say about it. And if it's anything like the 2020 Wilson T-Rex, I'm in for a real treat of ideas and opinions. So take care, my friends, and have a great Christmas and a great 2022.